actually going to see some um, active learning systems at work, or just general interactive learning systems at work? Yeah, so um, this is, uh, this is going to be about a contextual bandit system that uh, we've been uh, building at Microsoft uh, for last two to three years. Um, and this work with a large number of colleagues in research and uh, and devs and um, uh, some very uh, cooperative uh, product teams who sort of let us basically mess around with their uh, system while we got our details right. Um, okay, so just a very quick snapshot of contextual bandit learning, uh, although probably most people uh, are familiar with it in some form or, or the other. Uh, so what the general setup, right, is there's an underlying state of the world, uh, or uh, which, we'll, which we're gonna call the context. We get to observe this thing, we choose an action, we get to observe the reward on the chosen action. Um, There's not reinforcement learning, so my actions have only consequences on the immediate reward, but they're not gonna transform my future state. Um, the next state of the world will again be observed from, the, from an exogenous process, and this uh, interaction will go on. Uh, it is, however, like reinforcement learning partial information, so I will get to observe only the feedback on the chosen action, and I do not get in, any information about the other action's costs. Uh, the goal in general is to optimize this feedback. So for instance, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, I'll call the feedback reward uh, for this presentation. So we're thinking of maximizing the reward for the chosen actions. In particular, we are trying to uh, learn policies, right? So we're, we're trying to learn decision rules that uh, basically pick actions uh, given a context such that um, those uh, policies result in a high expected reward or high cumulative reward. Okay, so where does this come up? Uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is an actual example where um, the system is currently being used. So if you go to msn.com, um, uh, this is roughly, I think, uh, close to the current layout. It keeps on changing, but um, all, all of these different parts of the page, um, they wanna basically, uh, they, 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 they decide which news stories to put there. Um, so you can, of course, like have a global model that's just presenting the same sort of stories to every person, and you can maybe even just do it very editorially by uh, looking at what's sort of uh, popular and what's trending and uh, current and so on. Uh, but we have a lot more information. We, when a user arrives, um, often they are signed in, so we have a bunch of uh, profile information. We know what they've sort of read in the past and liked and so on. And, uh, we have uh, often a bunch of demographic uh, location and all this other information that you can take into account uh, while deciding what new stories to present to them that they would find interesting. And then you can observe how they respond, maybe by looking at what they click, maybe by how long they actually spent reading the stories you picked, um, or, uh, and so on, right? And we can, uh, whatever reward metric we settle on, we can try and optimize um, our uh, strategy to yield the desired user behavior. And uh, we can kind of also formally think about what, uh, what the contextual bandit assumption implies here, which is uh, we're roughly thinking of um, users being independent of each other, which is hopefully a very reasonable assumption to be making in this problem, right? That uh, one user arrives and their visit has no influence whatsoever on how another user uh, if I even if I give them a really crappy or a really great experience, that probably does not uh, directly impact the experience of the next user. That's the contextual boundary assumption. And uh, that's not limited to news recommendation. So in general, you, uh, it definitely applies to content recommendation problems of all shapes and sizes. And um, that's kind of the most uh, maybe obvious fit. Um, you know, so, uh, but but there's many other places where. Uh, often with various degrees of imperfection, you can try and model them as contextual bandit problems. Um, I think especially with like a, a, a lot of uh, user interfaces being on sort of phone and continuously uh, or with reasonable latency talking to cloud and so on, there, there's just also very nice uh, chances that arise for various kinds of adaptive UI personalization and UI adaptation. Uh, and uh, that, 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 that I think is a pretty nice example as well. Um, 
So uh, people have uh, kind of tried to build um, things that often target specific verticals, specific applications, or classes of applications. Uh, but the goal is, you know, we, we, we have this general contextual bandit framework that it seemingly um, is trying to capture all of these things at once. So can we do the same thing? Just like we do that, we, we have a single formalism in theory that addresses many problems. Can we also have a single system that can address uh, many problems and solve all of them at, uh, well at once rather than designing uh, one-off systems? So remember, uh, what are the key, uh, th key challenges that we have to keep in mind? Uh, we know that we will receive feedback only on the actions we've taken, which means uh, we kind of need to explore. We need to try all the actions which we haven't ruled out as poor just yet. Chaba showed us yesterday, sometimes we should probably try them as well, but let's ignore that part. But we are in a contextual bandit setting, so uh, what's a good action? Uh, it depends on the context that I receive. And so that kind of suggests that we need to try every plausibly good action for every context, which would sort of be too much exploration if we do it naively. Uh, but we have to uh, do it. We know we have to do some randomized uh, choice of uh, actions, possibly. Um, it doesn't always have to be randomized, but um, I'll kind of talk about two classes of questions in a moment. For one of them, you really have to do randomization. For other one, uh, if we were only interested in doing explore exploit, we might be able to get away with some upper confidence bound type strategy. But uh, just kind of the very high level idea is gonna be that in many cases, uh, this, this is what the world looks like, that you know, people have built some sort of machine learned recommendation rule to, uh, to drive their system. And the idea is gonna be, we'll try and insert some small amount of randomization, hopefully, on, maybe on top of this existing system or by kind of uh, doing maybe even something more pervasive at the level of the types of models they're using and so on. And that's gonna now lead to if they were always showing, for instance, this space-related news story to a user before, now with some other probability they'll pick a different news story to recommend and so on. Uh, we'll make sure that uh, when we are doing this randomization, we actually um, um, record not just the decisions we are taking, but also sort of the probability distribution that we are inducing over these distributions, or at least the probability with which we are choosing the action that was recommended. Uh, and that's gonna be uh, so that I, I, I can uh, now concretely define the types of questions that we are interested in answering using such a system. So um, in reinforcement learning in general, there are two types of questions people like to answer. There's sort of the on policy setting, on policy question, which is, uh, given a problem instance, and given that you have uh, the option of acting in the world, how do you quickly learn a good policy uh, while incurring small regret? And this is basically where most of the contextual bandit algorithms focus, right? I'm gonna do some adaptive explore exploit and quickly try and learn a good policy. Um, people often don't like it when you're um, dynamically changing the behavior of machine learning algorithms. They kind of get worried that uh, you know, something uh, kind of unexpected will happen that will start driving system off the rails and you're, uh, may maybe you'll sort of have some reinforcement of bad behavior. Um, and so they often get nervous when we tell them about the latest and greatest algorithms to do these types of things. They say, no, 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 no. don't do this. Uh, do this other thing instead maybe. Uh, collect some data first. Let's do some machine learning on it um, in the comfort of our clusters. And uh, we'll, you know, once we've, uh, run that, run the resulting model through all sorts of checks and balances, we are willing to deploy it. Um, so obviously you can just ignore the fact that it's a uh, sort of reinforcement learning problem and just um, take whatever data you have and uh, treat it as sort of supervised data, which is what people do very often. But we actually have a systematic formalism for doing uh, reinforcement learning once we've collected data, which is the off policy setting, right? Which is um, just to take data that's uh, generated according to uh, um, some logging policy. And then we can use this data to uh, basically produce an estimate for the value of some other target policy pi that I might want to evaluate, right? And uh, there's a very simple way of doing this. Uh, cl most classical one is, for instance, inverse propensity scoring. What you do is, uh, so naively what you might do is, right, you would say, oh, I will go over my records every time uh, so I have a policy pi in mind. Every time I see a match, meaning I observe the reward of pi's action, I will accumulate them. 
just over those, just over the matching records. Obviously, this is going to be arbitrarily biased. Some policies might get more matches than others. So if we correct for the bias by basically dividing by the probability of uh, this event, and that leads to an easy and biased estimate. And uh, uh, you know, we know we know a lot of theoretical properties about this one. We have a bunch of improvements that have been proposed in the literature over this one, and uh, uh, we try, try try to use the improvements whenever possible, and so on. But but that's kind of the okay. So that's that's. That's the picture of the questions we have, uh, what we know about sort of uh, from, the, from the theory, from the formalism side. Um, we go and tell people that they should do this. Um, they try their best often to do this, and um, it fails. It fails for completely frustrating reasons. So, you know, there's like usually these things are happening in big organizations. There are teams that are kind of happening uh, that, that are responsible for handling different parts of the system. So there is one team that sort of handles uh, the, the, the front end maybe of the system. There's another team that sort of uh, does logging and uh, maybe a machine learn some machine learning guys are actually responsible for producing the models and so on. And these guys might decide, for instance, that, oh, um, you, you're logging too much data. Uh, this is you know, hurting like uh, performance. We're going to start uh, dropping some information from log. And um, one of the things that we noticed, people like to drop a lot for one reason or the other is these probabilities, because they cannot see for the life of them why it's useful uh, to log probably. Or if you want to actually do more careful estimates here, you don't just need this one number, but you actually need the whole distribution if you want to give out like confidence intervals and such, right? So they, that's often the first thing that goes, which is very frustrating. Um, sometimes people log them, but then they even like somehow they manage to come up with incorrect probability. So you'll sort of get a purported pro probability. Somebody tells you, yeah, this was done with uniform randomization. And then you can, I mean, you can go and verify based on frequencies of things that, you know, whether this was the allegedly uniform or not. And you find out that, no, it's very, very non-uniform what you're seeing in the data, right? So there's, uh, there, there's all kinds of things that uh, kind of go wrong. Often one of the things that goes wrong is that people have kind of, uh, people are working at one level of uh, stack in a very complex system, and there's all kinds of downstream modifications that happen to, so, so maybe you make a recommendation, then there is some special promotion going on which says, oh, actually, you know what, in the first slot, you are always gonna put this promotional offer. And now, uh, what you recorded is the action maybe um, that was, um, taken after you did this replacement, and you ascribed the probability that was for the suggested action, which was before this replacement, and there's just like frustrating practical things that come in the way. So, so, so we, we wasted quite a bit of our time kind of discovering these bugs. So at some point we said, okay, this, this, this is getting kind of intractable. Let's just try and build a system <coughs> ourselves, which will try and actually handle as many of these pieces as possible, so that we know that they interoperate correctly, so that we know that the information we need at the next layer is recorded by the previous layer, and, um, so that, and that they are easy to use so that people actually don't go off and do something different themselves. What, what, what did you mean by uh, the last one, the downstream machine learning? Yeah, so <laughs> that's kind of a funny one. So um, you know, generally, uh, you want to use as much information as you can to design useful features. So one thing, if you have um, this sort of probability sitting in the logs, sometimes people, oh, actually, maybe this will form a useful feature. And that can create some interesting uh, bias problems. So you don't want to do that, right? So it's just, um, yeah. Uh, so so, so, so that, that was kind of the design principle be behind uh, which, um, which started this project, and so we wanted to keep this whole system, uh, which is sort of in in our minds, handling the entire data life cycle. But at the same time, sometimes, for instance, people might want to use a different piece, like a different logging subsystem or a different type of learner. So we did want to make things modular as well. So that's that's sort of been the the key design principle, and kind of the you know. Uh, Utopian hope is that maybe for many problems, you can just come, this is so automated and convenient that maybe you can just take uh, an ML person out of the loop, which means I have to answer fewer emails. Right, so we, uh, we as we were building this, um, uh, the, these, uh, these guys from MSN, they were looking for um, 
something to help them with personalized recommendations for users. So it was a very fortuitous timing. They came to us. Um, we worked with them for a while and eventually got deployed. And um, it, it's been uh, running for about a year and a half now, or about a year now. Uh, and um, th this is just like a small snapshot. So, so obviously, uh, so the baseline was just kind of, uh, here the baseline was very weak. They were just doing things kind of by, by hand before, just uh, human editors deciding these are kind of interesting news stories to display to everybody right now. But so over this baseline, still you see, I mean, they, they, but they change these things pretty quickly. So it's, while it's a human baseline, it's not a completely trivial one, uh, but it's not personalized. So we get varying degrees of improvement across different days, but um, you know now this has been in production for a really long time, and the gains are consistently um, around like 20 to 30 percent um, on average in the number of clicks. And the other interesting thing is, um, like even though we are driving a very kind of immediate and maybe very coarse metric like uh, clicks, we are finding improvements in all other kinds of user engagement metrics that we, we didn't actually optimize for either. And they've uh, deployed these in sort of uh, multiple markets and multiple uh, segments. And uh, it keeps on kind of yielding good results, which is also a very good robustness check for the system. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the design of the system now. So the system conceptually breaks into um, kind of three big pieces. Uh, so, so there is kind of um, this piece that really uh, is the piece that's exposed to an application. Um, it's uh, we call it a client library, although so it's uh, either provided as a C sharp library or uh, you can just interact with it by making web API calls. Uh, so it just uh, it runs in the in Azure and you can just make a couple of quick API calls. So there is also kind of a JavaScript version that's now coming out and so on. But but coarsely, what happens is whatever front end application there is, it sends a context to this API. The API sends back a decision, and then at a later point when the reward information becomes available, it um, sends back a reward along with the associated key for um, this, uh, this context so that we know uh, this information has arrived. And as the information keeps arriving, uh, the, the information flows through a join server. So you know because, because kind of um, like these things can arrive very asynchronously, you have to do some joining later. And once you associate the, the, the sort of a complete context decision reward probability tuple, you can pass it to a learning layer. We do try and update our models actually online in real time. That was interesting about MSN. Usually people get freaked out about online learning, but they, they wanted to actually respond to breaking news and events like this. So they were really happy that we can do online learning. And um, uh, we, we told them, okay, we'll sort of redeploy a model every uh, five minutes or so. They, they couldn't do online learning right in the front end because you know that's just like too heavy for a web server uh, to do. So we said, okay, we'll deploy maybe a new model every five minutes or so, and um, that kind of works well enough. So we're we're sort of doing still some off policy learning here, right? Because we are not constantly adapting, but um, yeah. Um, so yeah, this, and then all of the exploration, right? Because this is where the decisions get. Recommended so exploration happens in this piece. This piece handles the correct logging, learning, and then the deployment is uh, just uh, kind of. Uh, uh. And, and then the the other piece that uh, that is kind of valuable about actually having such a system is, so we store all the data we are collecting. We store all the joint tuples also in an offline store uh, just in the cloud, and uh, because we've uh, gathered this data with exploration, then they can kind of. Like the usual things you would do with machine learning, right? You want to do your uh, feature engineering, hyperparameter tuning, whatever regularization, algorithm selection you want. You can go, you can do this offline, like all of your data science you can do here. You can uh, transfer these findings back whenever you want. So, uh, so that kind of uh, like all of the classical things can still be done. But now you know that they, they're counterfactually correct because you're doing them in the, in the correct manner for off-policy evaluation. So that's kind of the difference between the standard practice and doing it uh, using our system. Um, so the client library, uh, like I said, it's a, um, currently the C++ library is a little bit out of date, so there's well, mostly there's C Sharp. Um, and it's very scalable. It's extremely low latency, like MSN is using it in real time. I think it will have no trouble ha handling Bing scale as well. So, so it's pretty scalable. 
The web API, uh, obviously, it's very easy to integrate with, but um, it's uh, somewhat higher latency. Uh, we, we have a few uh, exploration schemes. Oh, I forgot to put our um, I love to con bandits algorithm here, which is also implemented. So, so we have a few, we have a few different um, uh, exploration schemes that are supported. Uh, we keep on adding them as we keep finding uh, new interesting things. Uh, the join server is, uh, is pretty simple. It's just uh, sort of it's receiving streaming data. Data arrives uh, with, um, uh, so the data points arrive. Each point has a different key associated with it. But maybe when you receive a reward information about, uh, say, this green record, it will have the same key, of course. So, you, so whenever you see kind of uh, events with same key, and you, we can we allow sort of people to record multiple rewards, even though you might be optimizing just one of them, so that you can also try experimenting with reward functions offline. So, and then there is an experimental duration associated uh, with the deployment. So, once this uh, duration elapses, then all the events with the same key are joined together, right? So that's just uh, very simple semantics. Um, uh, the learning we are using basically existing uh, contextual bandit algorithms. Um, the, I, I think the the nice thing uh, from a practical standpoint is so a lot of this thing, uh, these things currently the way they happen is people um, kind of they they take some data, they do some uh, counterfactual incorrect learning with it, then they are forced to run an A/B test to actually verify whether their offline gains translate to any offline improvement or online improvement or not. And um, uh, anecdotally, in uh, even with good machine learning, these are you know about like 20 to 30 percent at most success rate of the A/B tests. So, so what is this counterfactual correct and incorrect? So basically, whether like you're doing uh, off-policy uh, uh, evaluation and, and off-policy optimization properly, or are you just ignoring the fact that this information came from a, so for instance, what you can do, right? You, uh, you have recorded clicks on certain events. I, I can just treat this as a binary classification problem, run logistic regression, completely ignore the fact that some events, uh, that these events have a distribution that's influenced by my behavior policy, and that will be very different from when I, uh, now use a different model to drive things, right? So whether you're taking this uh, sort of distributional shift into account or not. Uh, but yeah, thanks for uh, that clarifying question. Um, right, so basically um, the nice thing is uh, what we are giving is we are giving estimates roughly that translate to this. If you ran this experiment last week and, and then you evaluate some policy based on the data you've collected, then this is the perf this is what the, the, uh, the your new policy would have done if you had deployed it during that same week, right? So that that's kind of the that's why it's a counterfactual question that's being answered, and we can we can do this. We can provide it's unbiased. We can provide confidence interval uh, around it and so on. So 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 that's kind of nice because it saved you the hassle of then what you came up with you have to get through an A/B test now you don't, right? So that's where it's kind of a, a, a lot of saving of uh, resources uh, and time, and in particular, it becomes really important because when you have to A-B test something, you have to kind of build it to a certain standard so that you can actually expose it to user traffic. If you just have to like evaluate something on a bunch of data you have on your laptop, I mean, you can go to party and whatever <laughs> crappy implementation you want to do, right? So, so it's really, it can be more powerful than you realize at the first blush. And then you, once you, no, you can, like, there's only a little gap between policy evaluation and policy optimization. So you can, if you want to find the best policy from some set of policies, you can basically cast this as a cost-sensitive multi-class classification problem, and we have algorithms to support that. You can update things online or batch. All of that works uh, quite well. So uh, I just wanted to give you some quick numbers to give you a um, sense of the scale, as well as a little bit about the simplicity. So with MSN, we are still using, by the way, Epsilon VD exploration, which is kind of um, funny, but uh, it works reasonably well. Um, so the setting there was, uh, the, the context was uh, they would uh, basically featureize the users in terms of uh, what they've, so they, they, they create a topic model for, ev for every document, and then uh, a user's uh, feature vector is what, are, what, are, what is an average of the topics of the documents that you've read in, say, the past month or past year or 
right? Some or average over some time period. And then obviously every action's feature vector is just its own topic model. And then so so this way you have a feature vector per action. Um, and then uh, they, they give us about 50 of these. And uh, uh, that's what we picked from. And uh, we are handling pretty good amount of traffic. So they have tens of millions of users and uh, roughly thousands of requests per second, which uh, we don't really have trouble handling. This is, by the way, also where online learning is really nice because you're just working over the data in a streaming fashion. It means you don't need to um, you know, run things in parallel and clusters or anything. You can just handle things very scalably. <coughs> and we, um, we, we also, uh, I mean, we do use some parallelism for like doing things like joining and so on, but training is completely sequential. And uh, yeah, works quite well. Um, so uh, there's a bunch of resources. There's a paper that actually describes a lot of the system. Um, this, is, uh, uh, this, is the, this is the website where you can uh, go and you can start playing. Uh, there's some there's some test drives and interactive guides and so on to 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 help people get started. It's uh, it's actually pretty pretty easy to get started with, um, and much easier obviously for people in the room because they understand everything about machine learning, not our typical user. Um, and all of the learning, almost uh, all of our uh, learning uh, technologies, also uh, in VW and. Pretty much the entire system is, by the way, open source. So you know, there's very little sort of we are keeping proprietary here. Obviously, it's a cloud service. So if you want to use the that service, then um, you will eventually get charged. Currently, we are not even charging there because we are just sort of ironing out various kinks in our system. Uh, but but we 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 have a few pilots, for instance, ongoing, mostly of a content recommendation flavor, and mostly things seem kind of robust and working now. So so yeah, uh, if you have uh, kind of interesting ideas of things to do with it, I think it might be a good time to consider playing with things because um, I think we have, a, we have everything in a pretty reasonable shape now and at least a lot of the defaults sort of work out of the box. And uh, if you have suggestions for how we might improve things, that would be amazing and uh, extremely welcome too. So yeah, I'll stop there. strange group of people <laughs> staring at me and taking pictures. Uh, <laughs> they love Next. I know, Next is very popular. Um, hi, so it my name's... It is pretty wide, right? Sorry? It is pretty wide. It is very wild, <laughs> I guess. That's right, that's right. Um, hi, so my name's Lalit. I'm a um, postdoc at the University of Michigan, and the last couple of years I've been working on this system for active learning called Next. Um, it kind of was a project that started at Wisconsin and lots of people involved with it. It was uh, originally an idea of Kevin Jamieson's, who was a grad student at Wisconsin at the time, is now a postdoc here at Berkeley. Um, Rob's been, of course, very involved with that. Um, and there's just been tons of other people. I mentioned Scott Sievert up there because he's currently a grad student at uh, Wisconsin who's, who's done a lot of development. So let me kind of say a few words about Next. This talk's a little bit um, different from Alex because I'll kind of mention you know, a lot of applications in the system. and um, so let's, let's begin. So like, 
you know, we, we've had, this, this week's been great, and I'd love to thank the organizers for kind of holding this, and I've enjoyed seeing all these talks, and a lot of the talks we've seen in this piece where it's like, here's this active learning algorithm, and then we went on Mechanical Turk, and we gathered a bunch of data, and here's kind of how, you know, we get our nice plots at the end, and like, the random curve is hopefully under the active curve, and everybody's really happy. And the, the, the thing about that, right, is like, so what we get to see in these talks is, is this kind of nice two boxes. We get to see an algorithm, and then we get to see this part where it's like, hey, you went and had a bunch of participants. But as we all probably know, there's kind of this challenging part in the middle, right? Like, you, if you're going to have these people on Mechanical Turk answering these questions and trying to evaluate these algorithms, you need to create some nice web page for them. You need to be able to monitor your experiment, make sure it's doing something reasonable. Um, how about traffic, right? So like, for example, if you put out too many hits on Mechanical Turk, if too many people are coming to your website at the same time, maybe your site will go down, right? Like, it's hard to kind of keep a low latency site up. Um, you obviously need to store your solutions, and you, and, and you know, most importantly, you need to have some huge computational backend, um, and you need to manage all of this. And this, this kind of the components in doing something real time in the crowd, right? This is a real time computational system. And, um, the truth of the matter is that like, your algorithm is kind of this, the start of this whole story. If you want to implement one of these things in the wild, it, it takes a decent amount of effort. So how, you know, how does this process look for people when they try to actually do this? Well, they start with the algorithm, and then you decide that you need a server and a database, and maybe you know, like Celery and RabbitMQ, you like, build all these little tools in for kind of monitoring tasks. So you can handle, like initially, you might handle five users. Now you can handle 10 users, et cetera. You go recruit a group of grad students, they're the big ones, undergrad students, the small ones, to implement all of this for you. Um, these guys get it working, it's running on laptops, everybody's really happy with it. Um, then you realize you want to do it in the wild, so you know, some learning happens. People go out there, they learn what Amazon's EC2 is, how to like, put stuff on cloud computing. Um, they store some information. There's more and more acronyms that pop up. Maybe at some point somebody gets this like wonderful idea of like, hey, let's containerize everything. Like, you know, well, let's use technologies, right? Everybody loves technology. And um, then at some point, a couple of months later, you you deploy this. You go to Amazon Mechanical Turk. You recruit these participants. You do your experiment. You write your paper. Um, and you know, maybe things are running. and You're really happy with it. And six months later down the road, Docker changes its version. This <laughs> actually extremely recently happened to us where Docker changes its version, and now no longer everything works. And you'd love to like, you know, go call these guys to help you out, but unfortunately they're like at their new cool startup that implements active learning algorithms. So like, you're, I think this is like not an uncommon story, and I think for, um, I think this happens a lot, and it's, it's kind of hard to build these systems, right? It's hard to, it's, it's not too bad to kind of build something you can kind of get up quickly and running, um, but it's kind of hard to build something you can kind of reuse over and over again. And so next, the system we've come up with, and you can kind of see it at nextml.org, um, tries to fix this issue. So uh, as I mentioned, there's lots of people involved in it, and we've tried to build a very general purpose system for you to implement active learning algorithms in. And so I'll take the rest of this talk and basically show you guys a short demo of how it looks, how it works, um, and talk about kind of some of the success stories we've had over the last couple of years using Next. So let me start first. Um, kind of start off by saying, you know, who, who, who's Next really aimed at? And it's kind of the whole spectrum. So on one end, it's um, researchers, right? Like machine learning researchers who want to test um, their algorithms out. So Lee was talking yesterday about how the Air Force Research Lab uses Next for active image classification. But then there's a lot of experimentalists who might be kind of on the more, um, for, in, in our case, we've seen, worked with a lot of psychologists, a lot of sociologists. So some of you probably met James Evans here, who's here for most of the week, and Nandana who are using Next to kind of do some adaptive data collection in um, various sociological, for various sociological questions. And then, you know, at the very other end of the spectrum, there's people in industry. So for example, we helped the New Yorker kind of do this data collection where they have this caption contest. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that, so um, I'll come back to that. But the point is, it's kind of, we've tried to really create a tool that we feel that everybody can use. So um, what, w one question we often get is kind of, you know, and this is something I, I, I want to clarify earlier, is like, you know, what, what applications can Next really support? Like, which specific active learning class applications you can do? And I think it's worth kind of breaking that question down. So there's applications. So for example, there's um, classi a classification task, right? Or like a ranking task or a best arm identification task. And for all these applications, we have many algorithms that we could try to implement and many algorithms we could use. Um, and it's important to have the ability to kind of evaluate these different algorithms for any given task you want to do, right? Even if you're just 
even if you're just doing some research, you have a new algorithm. You probably want to test this against older algorithms in a real life setting. So Next is very much based around this idea that you have one main learning application and you kind of plug and play algorithms into that application. And it kind of, you know, it's really designed to kind of facilitate this plugging and playing of different algorithms. So to get back to this question of, you know, what applications can Next really support? Kind of out of the box, we can do a whole bunch of things. We have algorithms implemented for contextual bandits, um, various bandit applications, various classification applications, ordinal embedding. Adam Kalai earlier this week spoke about um, crowd kernel. That's one application we've played a lot with, uh, various kind of linear bandit techniques. Um, but the truth of the matter is, is that if you're interested and wanted to try to use it for <laughs> anything else, you could, you could pretty much implement anything you want. And I'll talk a little bit about what it takes to implement something new in Next um, as I go along. So uh, I'll just say, yeah, let me, let me say one more kind of, yeah, let me say one more quick word about like what, what this takes. And the point is, is that um, when you're designing one of these systems to do active learning, and there's, there's a lot on the slide, but I'll kind of just say it quickly. When you're designing one of these systems to do active learning, really the parts you only want to implement are what it takes to kind of start up an experiment, right? So if you're doing some kind of bandit, multi arm bandit problem, you know, you want to be able to specify, hey, I have n bandits. Maybe there's some feature vectors associated with them or something like this. But then you also just want to be able to specify information around how do you get a query. So if a new participant comes to your experiment, how can they request a query? How you kind of process the answer around that query. And in the background, you have some process that's running to constantly update your model, whether you're doing that after every query or doing that in some kind of batch job. And you also need to have some ability to get the model. So for example, in a best arm identification process, you should have a way to kind of get the best arm and see confidences around that arm. And so in the next system, um, this picture is a little bit complicated, but, but basically all that happens is these queries, uh, the, the, the crowd requests a query, we basically have some system set up to handle lots and lots of simultaneous requests. This kind of goes to this algorithm manager. So again, under this, this model that we can kind of handle multiple algorithms at the same time. Um, your code kicks in. So somehow the only part you really have to worry about is kind of implementing these kinds of five functions, especially the get query process answer and update model. And then we can send the query all the way back out. So for example, if it's some kind of triplet task, that's how that would look. And similar with the process answer. But the thing I'm really trying to kind of emphasize here is that when you do want to implement something in Next, it really is as easy as like you, you literally open up a file with these three functions in it and you can just kind of implement those there. So I wanted to do a quick demo and I encourage people to try this on their phones. Yeah, Alec. So, uh, so, so for active learning, the semantics of get query kind of seem more obvious. Uh, is the query basically an action if you were doing a contextual bandit or best time identification type thing? What's a query then? A query is when a user comes to your application, what question you're going to ask them. Right, so in best time identification. So in best time identification. Yeah, sure. Um, or you, you present them with an arm and they you know, respond with a reward. In the triplets problem, it's you show them some triplet and you ask them to kind of answer that question. Classification, it's some kind of labeling. Yeah, yeah. And does this, uh, feel like, do you have any assumptions or restrictions on sort of the, like, latency of this process? Does it have to be kind of, if you have a query, uh, do you, does the user have to answer right away? Can the information sort of uh, come, come back to you at a much? The information can come back whenever. Okay. So I'll say, so I'll make two comments about that. One, because the system's very flexible, mm -hmm. um, how you choose to process those queries and in what order is up to you. So for example, if you want to do something totally random and update a model at the end, you can do that if you want. If you want to kind of decide that, hey, every time I get a new 100 ones in, I'm going to do process kind of a batch of 100, that's also up to you as well. Uh, but I'm curious about how, how do you deal with it for the things that uh, you have implemented? Because like, one, one thing you have to kind of be careful about in, in the setting is right. this itself can kind of sometimes cause a bias. Like if I have the Easy examples, maybe a uh, user just answers them right away. Harder ones are answered with a, a maybe higher latency. So then uh, if I just sort of process things as they come, mm -hmm. it will inject an undesirable bias in my learning. Yeah, I don't think we ha in any of our applications we're really addressing that issue specifically. I see. But you could. So okay. for example, like. We, we, yeah, we sort of carefully designed around this. And around the, with this joint system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it'd be interesting to kind of discuss how to implement that. Um, one thing that we, 
I mean, in a lot of app our applications, like for example, these kernel banded applications, the main thing we try to do is just make sure we have some kind of extremely, f like, you know, you want to give these queries out as fast as possible. And I think in a lot of our applications, there isn't as much, maybe it's a little bit different from ad serving in that case, because for a lot of our applications so far, the way it's worked is very much the query goes out, people respond back, and we're much more interested in, um, low latency queries and high throughput at a given time because it is something like a mechanical Turk experiment. So I think maybe that, um, yes, you know, we don't have some drift over time that we have to worry about as much. But, but presumably it would be nice if um, like a doctor could also use this. For yeah, exactly. Doctor. So right, that's super know. interesting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So um, it would be fun if people want to try this. So nextml.org slash Simons and nextml.org slash caption contest. So I put up two kind of experiments and let me, Go to them. So, for example, here's one of a triplet task. So, basically, um, sorry, the instructions are extremely small up there, but select the face on the bottom or top as the closest emo emotional expression to the face on the top, right? So, this is the kind of thing Anne was talking about. I think that's a really hard query. This is exactly what you're talking about. So, let's say maybe this one, because I don't know, sad is a little bit closer. I don't know what that face is. And so, we can answer these questions. I think that one, do people agree? Something like this. Yeah, these are tough. Um, and the point is, is that you have kind of two components here. One is you can ask these, these queries. Um, and in the back, Next also provides you with a lot of tools for kind of monitoring this experiment. So um, again, there are all these issues kind of around latency and things like that. So we give you ways to kind of track, you know, for every time one of these queries is asked, how long does that take? How long does it take to process the answer? How long does it kind of take to update the model, et cetera? Um, and you can also kind of build in statistics. So if people are kind of interested in doing this task, if anybody does it, we can look at the end and see what kind of embedding we get um, from these ordinal embedding questions. So another task that I mentioned kind of alluded to before um, is kind of this New Yorker task. So this is, I guess, this week's cartoon that we're judging. Um, so, I, so the idea in this cartoon contest is the New Yorker every week has um, they do this caption contest, and the cartoon goes out there to the wild, um, and people send in captions, right? And so they get about 5,000 of these captions every week, and they need to decide the funniest one. Uh, and so we've been helping them using Next to kind of address that. Um, so for heaven's sake, it's just gluten. It's actually kind of funny. I'll give it a somewhat funny. Anyways, and so <laughs> we basically rank these 5,000 captions and give them an answer Every week, you look hot. Okay, that's actually pretty good. Oh okay, yeah. Anyways, this is this is fun. Um, but so this is kind of an example of some of the things you can you can do with Next. So, so let me um, for the rest of the talk, I just kind of want to talk about some of the people who are using it. Um, so as I mentioned before, the New York Cap Caption Contest has been one of the big ones. So this is something. Um, so Bob Bob Mankoff, the cartoon editor at the New Yorker, came to us looking for a system to do this, and um, I think every week we get around 15 to 20,000 people who kind of go onto the site. We collect around uh, half a million to uh, three quarters of a million responses. Um, and Irvin, who's here at the conference as well, has kind of been working on improving some of these algorithms. Um, and one thing, we've, one thing that's been really great about this is we've implemented various adaptive algorithms, like little UCV, for, for this task. Um, and we've seen kind of pretty quickly, we, we did, so we've gathered about a year of data at this point and somewhere kind of early on, I think after 20 contests or so, we kind of asked this question which was, you know, I think there was like a series of contests where basically the editor didn't really look at the dashboards and we kind of had him use his old process before he was using Next to kind of pick the caption. And then we are also um, collecting these queries using this little UCB method and this random method and we tried to see, you know, how often is the winning caption kind of in the top 10. And I think this was based off of 10 or 15 captions. And you can kind of see that like with far fewer queries, um, the probability that it would be in the top 10 for a little UCV was significantly higher than it is for random. So this was one of the kind of first real successes you saw and it was nice to see that there was kind of a win on adaptive data collection. So um, again, I, we, you saw the ordinal ex embedding experiment there. I just want to say a few more words about this because this has been definitely one of the places where we've really used Next heavily. Um, so Jerry, uh, a few years back, he came up with this data set called the strange, or this, this sequence of images, these strange fruit images. And the idea is, is that it's some kind of one parameter family that goes from something extremely spiky to something that's not so spiky. 
And the way these, these images were kind of cooked up is so that like between any two of them, it's kind of at the threshold of like human perception between any two of them. I, for one, cannot tell the difference between like any of those four, but people tell me there are small differences. But we went out and we asked this, we did this triplet task on Mechanical Turk to kind of see, you know, if we ask these triplet comparisons, these ordinal embedding comparisons, can we recover this one dimensional manifold that these shapes are lying on? So, and we did this using several different kind of data collection ad, um, algorithms. We used various active data collection algorithms. We used just kind of random sampling. We used various objectives for how to actually get the embedding once you knew the triplets. And we got, we were able to kind of use next to create this nice kind of grid of all the possibilities. So these are various, um, the rows correspond to various adaptive algorithms and the columns correspond to various embedding techniques. Um, here's the crowd kernel method that Adam talked about, and I do think, you know, we, we, we felt that crowd kernel kind of had the, the best quality embedding. You very much kind of recover this line. Um, and what was interesting about this, though, is that even though you kind of get the, embe the, the embeddings, where you might be interested in saying, you know, did active really outperform random in this problem? And what we noticed was by measuring, so we went out and gathered a lot of these triplets, and we kind of asked what was the generalization error on some kind of holdout set of the resulting embedding. So you, you gather a bunch of triplets, you learn an embedding, you test on, the, on a holdout set of triplets to see how well you did. And what we, what we kind of noticed, we didn't really see a gain on generalization from error from doing this active uh, sampling approach. And this was a very interesting thing to us because, you know, there's a lot of techniques out there at this point for doing, for active strategies to this problem. So I think it's kind of a very interesting area of research um, and how do you do this ordinal embedding problem actively? And I'd love to kind of see more experiments out there, kind of active versus passive sampling on this problem. So that's kind of the ordinal embedding problem. And a little bit more on the applied side of the ordinal embedding problem. Um, one of our partners on this has been Tim Rogers, who's a cognitive psychologist at UW-Madison. And he's very interested in this, this emotion task that I showed you guys before. Um, so maybe we'll get a picture like that at the end if anybody does it, and maybe we won't. But basically, you can go out there and ask, um, is the emotion in face I more like the emotion in face J or the emotion in face K? It's very, and um, one of the things that's kind of uh, been around since the 70s in cognitive psychology models is this like circular model of emotion. I don't understand this particularly well, but from what I understand is like the correct somehow embedding or representation of emotions should go from happiness on one end to kind of you know, fear and anger kind of on the opposite ends and things should arise in a circle. So we went out and collected a lot of triplets of this form using some kind of adaptive data tech, uh, collection technique and we were pretty excited to see that we were able to compute the embedding and recover kind of this conjectured circle um, in the cognitive psychology literature. And in general, I think for a lot of the people we work with who are psychologists and sociologists and kind of in the humanities, they're extremely interested in how can you do adaptive data collection faster. And you know, does it work? Do you actually see the games or gains over random? Um, so this was kind of a fun experiment to try with them. Along these lines, Blake uh, Mason, who's here, and Martina Rao, also um, Martina's in the educational psychology department at Wisconsin, and Blake's Grad Student Abroad, they kind of did a very similar experiment with um, chemistry data molecules. So they went to a chemistry class, and they basically said, you know, here's here's kind of a triplet of three molecules. Um, which of the bottom two molecules is closest to the top molecule and they try to create an embedding. And the goal of understanding, getting these kinds of features is eventually to try to work towards, to work towards a personalized tutoring system. So in this case, they went and gathered a bunch of these queries from um, this chemistry class and you, know, you get some kind of embedding back and some kind of clustering that's not so unrealistic from the point of view of chemistry. I don't know anything about chemistry. Um, I also suspect it might just be because like, you know, all these are like cyclic hydrocarbons. They do all kind of look alike, right? So it's not, it's not immediately clear you know, what, um, what's kind of being perceived here, but it's nice to, I think for them, it's nice to be able to use Next as a tool to run a lot of the experiments, gather data, and try to understand something about perception in these contexts. So I'll mention, uh, um, kind of flip, flipping back to a use of Next that's happening in industry right now. Another partner we've had is American Family Insurance. So this is Devin, he uh, works at AmFam. And one thing he's been using Next for is they're very interested in kind of doing document tagging and kind of sentiment analysis on documents and having active algorithms to do this. 
So they basically use some active classification techniques and they go out there and they basically, you know, before people log into their computers every morning once they get to work, they answer one or two questions. And so it's things like, you know, they'll show people a claim note and they'll say, does the following claim note mention the concept of a rental car? So they're trying to build up a classification, a classifier for whether a document would have the phrase rental car or something like this. Um, or, you know, what is the sentiment of this note? Things of this form. And so they've been kind of playing around with Next and trying various kind of internal ways of using it. Um, the next task, this has been a project that's kind of going on in Rob's group, um, is around personalized image search. So the idea in this is they worked with the Zappos 50K data set. And if I understand correctly, the idea of this project was that they were basically trying to do some kind of image search tasks. So you're given some starting kind of primer image, so like a red boot. And they were using various kind of awful linear banded techniques to ask, you know, ask questions about is this shoe that you see similar to the red boot that you started off or not? Um, so they use next on this, and the kinds of queries were of this form, like, you know, they tell people, they kind of prime people and tell them pick things that look like red boots, and they keep showing them shoes, and they use various active algorithms, and they it was it was a very interesting experiment. And one thing that they ended up finding is that if you kind of looked at how, in terms of some kind of search retrieval error, or some, yeah, in terms of some kind of retrieval uh, re reward system, these kinds of active algorithms, which are kind of up here, perform significantly better than just using some form of nearest neighbor retrieval on uh, various cafe features. So this, this yeah, so it was kind of an interesting experiment. They were able to apply active learning in this world of image search and kind of a, Kind of an interesting, awful way. But I, I don't know a ton about the details of the experiment, so I won't go a ton into it, but um, I'm happy to put you in touch with people who did it. So, but it was a kind of another example of a nice application of Next. So let me kind of, I also wanted to mention Lee here. So Lee's been using Next heavily at the Air Force Research Lab the way he mentioned yesterday, and so you guys can talk with him if you're kind of interested in how they're doing it. And they're, they have a lot of resources, so they get to run on really huge machines with lots of people simultaneously. It's super cool. So I just kind of want to finish off um, and basically say that like, you know what's been nice about Next for us is kind of there's there's a nice cycle here that we work on it, we develop it, we get to try our own algorithms on it, and this really kind of informs others. I think you know there's for a lot of the projects I've mentioned before, I've kind of mentioned only the first step when we ran the experiments. There's for almost all of them, there's been like second and third step where the experiment got ran. People are able to take that data, develop new theory around it, run more experiments. There's a lot of iteration that happens. And then that feeds into you know, these experimentalists who really do want to use it, these psychologists and sociologists we've been working with. And it's kind of you know, filtered its way all the way into industry and kind of come back to us. Um, and we've, we've been extremely excited that the cycles happen. It's helped us make Next better, and it's helped others kind of collect the data they want to collect. So I'll just kind of finish up. Sorry. I'll running a little long time, so I'll kind of finish up. This is the current Next team, so Kevin, um, Rob, Scott Siebert, Rudy Bargava, who are all at Wisconsin, and uh, well, Kevin's, Kevin's here, and I, and so you know, if you have any questions, feel free to check in. So, sounds good, thanks. Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> I guess uh, the, the, the side of things that sort of relevant to researchers that you talked about mostly is where I have an algorithm and then I have to sort of, uh, I, I can use the system which reduces a lot of complexity for me, but I still have to sort of go and get my own crowd and pay for them and so on, right? Yeah. But you're actually collecting some very sort of valuable data in all of these things yeah. that you're already doing. So what I'm curious about is, um, well, first, like, do you plan to make that data available? Yeah, so if you actually go to the website, um, there are links to places where we've created some data repositories. So then all the New Yorker data is available, and I think a lot of the triplets data is available as well, too. Uh, and sort of the, uh, the follow-up to that question is, so um, is, there, is the data uh, put sort of collected and recorded in a way that so one thing that's, again, very uh, tricky often with uh, practical, uh, practical active learning is that if I kind of change my algorithm, it might just request mm -hmm. different queries from the ones that you've right. right? So 
um, the, the strategies that you're employing to collect and then um, log the data, do they make it easy to uh, do sort of these off-policy type things, or? Yeah, for the most part. I mean, okay. we're, so there is a couple things. I mean, one thing is, is that, um, Again, everything in Next, like it's very reproducible. Like if you run an experiment, you can kind of run the same thing again. You're right that the data you've collected has changed, but in a lot of the data collections we're doing, we're kind of trying to ensure that we're also getting, um, you know, everything's extremely timestamped. You know exactly which participant was kind of involved in the answering of that query, which algorithm that query kind of came from. Um, but we also make sure that at least for the data collects we've released, there's some random data that was also collected. So the policies vary a lot, so, but, and on every single one of these experiments, and they've all been very much like evaluation experiments, right? Like, I think when, when I work with somebody, I would never recommend you go straight to an active algorithm, um, <laughs> kind of in the short run, because um, it's like with the triplets thing, it's not clear to me that there's actually a gain, an adaptive gain. So why bias your why bias your collect? So I, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. So all all of that's kind of um, easy to use, and you can kind of get it out of the system extremely easily. Okay. So, cool. yeah. So I was wondering um, if uh, this the system that you currently have is able to support sort of like more elaborate UIs. Yeah, you can do whatever you want. So basically, the way it's set up, right? That's that's a good question because a lot of people want to build pretty elaborate UIs. Um, it's all just kind of done in standard HTML and JavaScript. And it's kind of, everything's been very, like, it's been very designed to just be kind of plug and play. So you can kind of, you design your UI, decide exactly what interface you want to use um, in terms of how you want it to kind of connect to your algorithm, like where you want that data flow to go. You specify all of that explicitly in either some YAML or JSON file. So you, it's, like, it's like, you know, if you've ever had to code Verilog or something, it's like you very much like tie up inputs and outputs and then everything's kind of just generated for you. Um, so it's, it's pretty flexible when it comes to things like that. And that's what allows us, like just kind of going back to these dashboards too, like that's kind of what allows for these dashboards. Um, you know, so like for the example, the New Yorker wanted a very different UI from the thing we kind of just had built in, which is much more simple looking, right? So it's, it's, it's easy to do. So I'm kind of curious to know if this embedding did anything. Sorry. Doesn't look like it. <laughs> but we probably need some more data. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Those two might belong together. It's hard to tell. So anyways, but the point is you can kind of add any of these visual elements that you want. So. Great. Yeah. Uh, does your system um, allow you to kind of um, uh, monitor individual user behavior and kind of assign them kind of scores or weightings and Yes, so this has actually been kind of tricky. So here's what, here's what we can do well right now, and to do anything more, you'd have to add on. What we can do well is, is that the minute you kind of show up, so for example, the minute you show up to this page, we return some identifier that belongs to you on every single okay. session. The thing we do not do is we don't, like, on every single query, sorry, we don't create sessions right now to kind of track who you are. So if you refresh this page, you're a totally different user from the point of view of the system, but like, that's one of the modifications, you know, like that's, it wouldn't be difficult to do that. Yeah. But, but the responses to the system are tagged by this user. So like if I get a, a sequence of... Uh, yes, of yes, yes, it's wrong. tagged by this user. And so you have tracked all that, you have the timestamp, you know exactly when they got the query, you know exactly when they clicked on that thing, when they returned it, um, and you can do anything else. So there was some team, I think it was the AmFam team who were actually trying to do this with some eye tracking software and some mouse tracking software kind of thing. And one thing about all of this that I didn't say and I should, should kind of emphasize was on one slide I skipped here was just like, at the end of the day, you have all of this kind of UI, but it is just um, a REST API. So very similar to kind of, kind of this Microsoft service. There's some REST API there. And so for example, for the New Yorker, they don't even really use our kind of UI. They're just doing some request through their servers so they're able to track users because they have the infrastructure set up to do sessions and things. So it's kind of infinitely flexible there um, in terms of that kind of thing, so. Great. Thanks. <laughs>